this was an interesting thing for me to talk about or to think about this year because, um, and I was thinking about last year, I actually talked about kind of like an opposite problem or an opposite challenge. I talked about just the huge amount of information that marketers are talking about and how we can prevent um, people feeling like they're really, really overwhelmed. And right now, in talking about storytelling, I'm kind of talking about the opposite, how to start with something small and actually create a really, really big impact from that. And um, you know, the, the one thing that I've noticed a lot is that it's really, really hot as a marketing topic. Um, I see it talking about, being talked about a lot. Like a lot of marketers are like, I don't want to put up an ad. I want to tell a story. How do we tell the story? How do we tell our firm's story? What's our story? What's their story? Um, so it's being talked a lot. You can do some metrics on this. It's just some Google Analytics just based on, you know, this Google Trends, right? If you want to know how hot a topic is, you can go search it, and it'll tell you how many other times people are searching for it. But, you know, because I have an intellectual bent to a lot of what I do, I always start with questions about why. So um, I'm always interested in why is it so effective? Why is everyone talking about it? Um, so I did some, some bouncing around. I've left off the sources of these quotes to, you know, sort of protect the innocent. But these are the things that I read. Uh, stories help you remember things and how we are reminded, which was a little awkward. Stories work because we find them interesting. Everybody loves a good story. So if you, um, I have a philosophy background. If anybody else has ever taken a philosophy course, you know that the technical term for statements like this is a tautology. It's a statement that's true because it has to be true. Like stories work because we find them interesting. All you did was say, uh, you know, or you could also have said they're interesting because they work, right? Like you're not really saying anything about it. The non-technical term for that is just uh, lame. <laughs> <laughs> It's totally unhelpful. I found nothing in the marketing information about like, I found marketers with good advice about how to tell a story, but they couldn't, they didn't really tell them, say why, why should you? Um, and if you are super lame, like if you leave that up just to, uh, just to statements like that, you, you run a danger of ending up, let's see, here, uh, which is a pretty funny cartoon I had. Uh, so, so brand storytelling. 50% more claims than leading brand. Consumers lived happily ever after the end, right? Um, so it's got to be something more to that. There's got to be something more about why is it so effective? Why are we talking about it? Um, so I'd like to just start with some simple observations. Uh, storytelling is universally pervasive. So this just comes out of some of the cognitive science and anthropological work that you can read out there. There are no cultures without stories. There are cultures without visual art. There are cultures without math. There are some cultures without numbers. There are no cultures that do not engage in storytelling. Um, it's not taught. Anybody who has a toddler or has even watched a toddler play for a few seconds knows that you do not teach kids how to tell stories. They will tell themselves stories when they're left alone. right? Um, and it's fundamental to how we know and understand things. It is absolutely fundamental just to how we learn. So um, I decided to take kind of an anthropological or linguistic search to, you know, why did we evolve into storytellers? Um, and it's something that I've actually been interested in for a long time. About 30 years ago, the answer was coming from anthropologists, and their answers was ba basically, you know, what you're seeing on the wall. The original thought was that it really had to do with that lower level of the Maslow's hierarchy that Ellison brought up. It was about survival. We developed language and started telling stories so we could teach people how to hunt elk and build a shelter, and that was the advantage, so that we could transfer these complex skills. Um, what's interesting about that is that the scientists have done a complete 180 in the last, say, about 30 years. Um, a lot of people have looked at that and said, you know what, that's, if you actually look at how those skills are transferred, it's a lot of looking and doing. People don't actually talk and teach that way. And if you actually look at what they're spending their time talking to each other about, the stories they're saying, it has nothing to do with survival. Right? That's not the stories that we tell. Um, we tell different stories. So here's a couple books uh, for the more scientifically minded. Uh, a really good book that dives into this is The Language Instinct. It's been out since the 90s. It's a great book if you haven't read it. It's a great general read. If you're um, on the humanities side, you can check out this one from Brian Boyd. He's a professor of English, actually, uh, in Australia. And uh, he has this really fascinating book on the origin of stories. He does actually go through a lot of scientific literature to make his point. And they both came to two slightly different but similar conclusions about why we develop language and why we are such incredible storytellers, why we tell each other stories all the time. And here are their answers. So Steven Pinker says it's all about gossip. And Brian Boyd says it's all about play. Um, 
and that's they're completely serious. There's a lot of other people who agree with them. And that means they are actually seriously saying we developed language, we developed these giant brains um, that are really resource intensive and actually make birth, childbirth, unassisted childbirth, really dangerous so that we can engage in incredibly frivolous activities. Um, I will say this child uh, is not me as a child. So that's come up several times, though I do love him. <laughs> Uh, even though the picture was fuzzy, I decided I had to leave him in because I just think he's pretty awesome. So t just to take a step back, um, you know, what, what are we really talking about? Like, how could we have such a strong evolutionary drive um, to do something that on the face of it seems so frivolous and unrelated to our survival? How did that uh, really come about? And the answer is pretty um, straightforward once you think of it from the same perspective. So all of these activities that involve storytelling, gossiping, playing, true stories, which we call history, non-true stories, which we call fiction, even humor, all of these things are about sharing experiences and sharing experiences build relationships. And what all of these scientists have said is that it's not our skill set, it's not our ability to take down a bear that made us better evolutionary. It's evolutionarily. It's our ability to form complex, enduring relationships, especially against all these boundaries, across these boundaries, geographic boundaries, familial boundaries, linguistic boundaries. It's those strong relationships that we can form over time that have made us, from an evolutionary perspective, so incredibly successful. So if we take that and we flip it back to marketing, because that's why we're back here, um, why is it such effective, so effective a marketing tool? Well, stories share an experience Experiences build relationships, relationships drive success, right? This is why it works in marketing. So we come right back up to you know, the, the relationship cycle that John showed. Um, now I'm gonna actually talk to you about how to tell a story, so we're gonna get a little bit more fun fun. So much for theory, it's pretty awesome theory, if I do say so myself, but um, we're gonna talk about how to tell it. Here are the magical rules to telling a good story. There are no rules. Um, and, you know, this should make sense to you. I mean, stories are incredibly various, right? They're told in different ways. They're about different subjects. So, of course, there are no rules, but here's some things to keep in mind. Context is critical. You heard that from Jen Bullitt. Context is really important. Um, people want to hear different stories at different times in their lives, at different moments during the day, um, based on what they care about, maybe on the long term, maybe on the short term. So, context is critical. Authenticity matters. Um, Ashley, my uh, partner in crime, Sarah Levine Meyer, is going to talk to you about authenticity specifically. Um, the, one of the points that I wanted to make is that ads are not stories. And I think this is actually really fundamental and is difficult for some marketers, especially outside legal. I think you guys are pretty much on this, but ads are about creating impressions. They're about chasing eyeballs. They're about really single moments. There are some ads that I think introduce you to the start of a story, there's no ad that can tell a story. It's just not possible. Um, stories create experience by bringing people from one place to another. That's one of the reasons why ads have a really hard time doing it. Stories bring you on a journey, whereas ads are about a moment. Um, and you're going to see this in some examples that I show you. This is one of the things where interactive actually really helps in terms of marketing. I think prior to a lot of interactive technology, really telling a good story other than literally just publishing the text was difficult. It was hard to make that happen. So there are two common approaches, specifically online, that I'm going to show you about. And they're pretty straightforward. The first are linear stories. right? They have a beginning and the end. And the second are associative stories, where I think the digital, me digital medium really comes to life. So for linear stories, uh, it's pretty straightforward. right? These are stories that are most similar to the stories that we read, whether they're fictional or non-fictional. They have a beginning and the end. When you think about how to lay out your content for a story or how to actually tell it, you do have to kind of think about that progression almost like a screenwriter or a novelist. You have to start with some interest, right? You've got to then provide more context so they understand a little bit more of the story. Go to a proposition. You know, a lot of classical stories focus in on conflict, right? That's what drive it. We all learn that, right? There's man versus man and man versus nature and God versus man, all these classical rules. That's, you know, if you're marketing professional services, I, I doubt you're going to end up with a you know, person against nature story. right? Um, but for the most part, you can use things like um, questions or propositions, especially if they're unexpected, to drive that main interest right, in a story. And you do want to think about how you get somebody to the resolution, because good stories not only have good beginnings, they also have good endings. 
Um, so I'm going to show you. I'm going to break out a PowerPoint. Yay! This is a British Airways story that showed up on my Facebook feed. Uh, I never fly British Airways. But um, I actually thought the site, I was really attracted to what they were doing in the site. So this is a good example of a linear story. So it starts with this sort of interest or proposition to fly, to serve. You have a main stage. And you're going to see a lot of these linear stories use a linear activity, like scrolling, which is highly linear, to, as the method for interaction. So as you scroll down the page, um, that story starts to develop into a little bit of content. So they start with this proposition to fly, to serve. Um, they go down to um, their new planes, the A380 and the Dreamliner, right? They go down to the, the terminal. You notice there's a progression of, of themes to be recognized, to be rewarded, so join the club. After they're sort of introducing you to a lot of experience, they're heading up towards a resolution. Um, they're using a combination of different kinds of imagery and content um, to sort of explain this whole experience. And then they finally end up here, which is uh, pretty cool. I'm going to show you uh, another example from the Times, which is actually pretty awesome. The New York Times, in, in case you guys haven't seen of it, I mean, most of the site is, is pretty standard, but they do occasionally, with the key content piece, do some really interesting things from an interactive perspective. So this background video that's kind of playing on a loop. There's no content to the video. It's just it's a little atmospheric. Um, they're giving you a little bit of hint, saying, hey, you should scroll, <laughs> right? Um, so the scrolling activity is interesting. Uh, this is another video that we're going to turn light. There we go. So now they're providing context, right? They're telling where, where was I just then, right? They're showing you exactly where you were. They're sort of setting up the story. Um, here they're uh, generating a little bit more interest in what the story has been. And then they get into a little bit of meat. So they do actually introduce some honest text, right? Some long form content. You can continue to scroll down, but then they break it up again. So another video, maybe when the show shifts into a different episode. It's so actually a really great way to bring people from one end of the story to another. I'm now going to switch um, back to PowerPoint, sorry. And we're going to show you uh, some other versions. So for associative stories, this is actually where, as I said, this is where technology really helps, I think. So associative stories um, don't think about the beginning and the end. And in fact, there is usually deliberately no beginning and no end. They arrange content often thematically, drawing connections where they make sense. But they often multiple journey options, right? Multiple paths from where you can go from one to another. The real goal is the experience. These are stories that really focus on that experience, maybe a little less so than the specific content. Um, and as I said, this is where interactive comes to play. Are there any uh, recovering English majors that actually had to read Ulysses? Right? Yeah. So it's a bear, you can all explain to people. Like, it's actually a notoriously difficult novel to read. And it's difficult because it's trying to be associative in a form, which is just text, that is by definition has to start in one place and go to another. And it actually creates a lot of work. Well, if you're actually taking this from an interactive perspective, you can relieve people from all that work, because you can make it really easy for them to follow associations and not have to start in one place and finish in another. So I'm going to break out again and just show you a little bit about what that looks like. So I'm going to start with a corporate example that I think gets part of the way there, but not all the way. So um, this is the GE site, which is a kind of surprising source of inspiration for us. Um, in a lot of our work, but they have, um, this is a, you follow a link off the home page and you get to this stories section dedicated to telling stories. They are arranged thematically pretty clearly on the core of, a, of an experience they're trying to share with you, moving, curing, powering, building, which is also tied to what they contribute or their purpose as a firm. Um, and they have these short sort of stories that you can sort of click on and see some information. This is a video. Um, that you know you can play and sort of see a little bit of a story. Then you can. I'm not actually not going to wait for that. Um, you can go back and uh, explore other stories. Some of them are content pieces, like text pieces. Some of them are videos. Um, the reason why I say it's it's uh, slightly imperfect or not all the way there is because I don't think it provides enough options or connections between different stories. You're kind of like at this giant menu of stories, and you can click into one, but you kind of have to go back up. So um, I don't think it's all the way there. The next one, which I think really does it a little bit better, is this is the um, Greenpeace's Into the Arctic um, piece. 
Um, it's a purely interactive piece. Um, I like this because you'll start to see that this story, which they're actually trying to tell, all these this collection of stories, would be nearly impossible to do in a narrative format. Like they tried to publish a book on the status of the architect and what's going on and all the content they have. I don't think it would have worked. So um, you know, you see some dynamic. There's a lot of cool things going on visually, dynamically built um, infographics, right? But the real magic you're going to start seeing is you start seeing like other content start to appear, right? So you can you have some options. You can actually explore this story literally geographically. You can go from point to point um, to see different things, right? About what's going on. Um, this is actually related to a trip that one of their ships take. Took, or you can actually look at it thematically over here, right? Um, as I said, there's no beginning, there's no end. There's lots of opportunity to sort of skip around and, and follow things from one theme to another. And it's all highly interactive, um, even though there are points where you go into text. And the final one that I'm going to show you is the one that is probably the most drastic, the most that leaves text. It's the one that leaves the text behind the most. Right? It's the one that is most about experience, most just about themes. This is Drexel University in Sacramento, actually, not in Pennsylvania. Same institution, but this is there. And this is um, a site that is um, really just based on explaining what the heck this university is about and who they're going for. And I'm just going to start clicking around it. So this is the first thing. This is always the first thing. There's a soundtrack behind this, but I'm not going to play it. It's just a couple notes being played a couple times. You start clicking into it. Um, you can start to see there is a video playing there. It's intentionally dark, right? And as you can see, there's not a lot of other content happening. I'm clicking in. I'm getting an idea, right, a theme. I can click some people. This one is kind of funny. I, I do sometimes wait for these videos for more to happen. Not a lot does, right? Occasionally another piece of paper gets struggled back in. The real point of this, right? The real point of this is for you to just get a feeling. Um, and then you can come down here and you can say, OK, I'm ready to check out your Master of Science thing. And you end up at a much more standard site, right? But for them, this actually takes the place of that, like, so what is Drexel all about? Like, what is this place about? What are you like? What is your culture about? They just show you in this sort of thing where there's no beginning, there's no end, there's different paths. It's purely associative. So just to kind of wrap it back up, here's some final thoughts on where you can actually bring it home. So I told you there are no magical steps, but I do have some ideas about where to start. Find the right story to tell. Um, I think most marketers actually have a good sense of what that could be. I'll give you some thoughts about professional services. Don't think about what you want to say. That's how you start writing a story you know, in a text base. But um, instead, especially in an interactive context, think about the experience you want to share. Um, and start small. right? Don't try to tell too much. The whole point of these techniques is to take something small and turn it into a big impact, rather than trying to cram a whole bunch of messages down. So for that final point about what stories you want to tell, um, it's kind of tough when you look at the, the content for a typical marketing services firm or professional services firm, what marketing has to deal with. This is just based on some you know, average numbers of items that are literally out there within you know, a typical website of a professional services firm. Um, not a lot of it is great, con great candidate for telling stories. So, you know, you're not going to really do it with biographies. The publications are really thought leadership that's content marketing based. You know, it's not the same sort of thing. I think the real opportunity are here in culture and experience. And I think the real, op the real options include things like this. Um, firm culture, history, client community commitment, approach to work, diversity in CSR. Basically, all the things that are on your site that are in danger of being overwhelmed by all the other things you're doing. Especially you know, these things that are in about the firm, or what your firm culture is like, or why you're different. These are important statements, important pieces about that really help build your brand. But on the, especially if you're also pursuing a content marketing strategy, which I think is a good thing, um, there is a danger that it could get completely lost. And so some of these new techniques that uh, I showed you, I think, are a great way to sort of reposition and make that content come back to life. And that's it.